think we all enjoy looking at little kids. Sometimes we enjoy being around them, and sometimes we don't enjoy being around them tremendously. But uh, they're fascinating little creatures when you watch them, and we, of course, were fascinating in our own right when we were young. I'd like to look at cognitive development today by G uh, Jean Piaget. Cognitive development, what does cognitive mean? You'll look at Freud, you'll have psychosexual development. You'll look at Erickson, and you'll have psychosocial development. And this is cognitive or developing of the thinking. And, and his main argument by, by Piaget, his main argument is that kids really don't think at different stages like you and I think. In fact, as parents, our older brothers and sisters, we might get frustrated with them uh, because we expect them to be miniature adults. In fact, that's how they used to be looked at. And, and if you look at paintings of the 19th century, they just shrink down the adult and made it a small person, expected to be seen and not heard. Well, their head was disproportionately big for their body compared to adults, and their thinking is very different. If we look at several things in his idea of cognitive development, one way to remember this is cogs turning, like you're thinking, you got the cogs or the gears turning, is let's get some basic vocabulary down, and then we'll take a look at, at his stages of, of, of thinking here. Uh, he talks about uh, a schema, uh, an operation, assimilation, and accommodation. We'll come back and define each one of these. All right, a schema is a basic uh, thought process or behavioral process, like hitting, uh, hitting my knee in the patella tendon is a basic thought process, or a basic reaction, rather. I'm sorry, not a thought process, but a basic stimulus response reaction. It's built in, it's not learned. Uh, a little baby has the uh, Babinski response, where you touch the bottom of his or her foot and she scrunches it up like this, scrunches the toes up. Probably an ancient uh, uh, throwback to grasping onto the mother's fur. Um, we have a startle respect for you in response where you scare a kid and the kid goes, oh my god, and just throws your eyes get real big, gets an expression on his face and throws its back back and it arches. Or right, those would be inborn schema. An operation is a reversible schema. And one of the stages will be pre-operational, so keep that in mind because it's talking about pre-logic. For example, when you and I were little kids, when we started doing math problems, our teacher would give us a sheet after sheet after sheet of math problems, and we'd go, holy, holy, am I ever going to get through this stuff? And you'd finally come to a problem like this, and we'd go, 7 plus 4 is 11. They go, Whoosh. You know, when you counted on your toes or your forehead or tapped your fingers or thought it out in your mind, you got the right answer. And then you look at the next problem, and it's 4 plus 7, and you go, oh, no, not another problem. This would be somebody who was pre-operational and didn't understand that this is a reversible problem or a reversible schema. These are two of the exact same problems, of course. Uh, one of the jokes that I call a reversible uh, schema or a reversible operation, uh, others might disagree with this, but I think it's a great joke. You remember the joke when you were a little kid in about third grade? You know, when you love toilet humor and you love talking about poop and you love talking about pee and all this good stuff and everybody's just laughing it up when you mention it. And you ask the question to a little kid, uh, if you're uh, an American on the way to the bathroom, what are you when you're in the bathroom? European. And little third graders just roll on the floor and laugh and have a great time. Now, what's happened there? Well, they've played the word European and it's also being able to be substituted for you are a peeing. Right? And plus you get bathroom humor in there, so what could be better for a third grader? So that's a, a, a reversible schema. Assimilation and accommodation are two powerful ideas that we need to, to deal with because we'll use them here in a moment. Assimilation means, let's say that I'm a little kid and I've got these basic categories of shapes. These basic categories of shapes. Everything that I know is going to fit in the shape of a triangle, a circle, or a square. Then all of a sudden I come across an octagon. You know, a stop sign shape. All right? Now, if I'm a little kid and I assimilate, I'm going to force that into one of my existing categories. So assimilation is I've got the categories, I know it all, and by God, the world's going to fit my categories no matter what. And you and I do that all the time, of course, right? It's a process that's never ending. 
Well, if you were a kid and you looked at this, what would it look like? Well, from a distance particularly, it might look like a circle if you focused on that. And uh, that's one of the things kids in one of the stages do is centration. They focus on only one aspect of an object. Or if you focused on the edges, it might fit into the square. So if you made this a circle, you would be assimilating, forcing the world's complexity into a simpler pattern that we have in our brain. We do this till the day we die, because the world is so complex, we can't come up with an original thought for every new variation we encounter. So it's not a bad process, it's a good process. Sometimes it can be used in bad ways. A combination would be if you had triangle, circle, square, and you encountered the stop sign, the octagon, a combination would be, hmm, I've got to add this to my world because it's not like the square, it's not like the circle, it's not like the triangle, it's a new category. So when we accommodate, we expand. In fact, going to college, one of the big things you're trying to do is to accommodate, and that is to look at the complexity of some of the things that we have often thought were simple, and question our basic ideas, and try to come up with new categories that explain the world in better ways. Now let's use these two terms, assimilation, forcing new ideas into old categories, or a combination, creating a new category because the world is too complex, and let's apply it very practically. Let's say that you had a bad experience with a police officer in your hometown, and you come out to your college, and you're sitting next to this uh, a gal all semester, and she seems like a wonderful person. Uh, she works hard, she's sweet, she's very caring, she helps you out when you miss class for notes, and then by goodness, halfway through the semester, you find out she's a cop. Now you got a problem. If you've already thought all cops are bad, you've got your categories down, and if you're going to assimilate, what would you have to do? You'd have to force her into the bad category so you'd start looking for bad qualities she had. She'd been fooling you all along, after all, because she didn't tell you she was a police officer. But if you're accommodating, you're going, my goodness, I've had some bad experiences with some police officers. Maybe there are a lot of police officers that are out there that are perfectly great people. And I have to add a new category of complexity that she's a cop and she's a good person. Okay? So that would be assimilation and accommodation. Now let's apply those to his stages of development. Piaget says that kids go through four basic stages of thinking, the first of which is sensory motor. And this is kind of fascinating. I've got pictures of uh, some of my kids, or some of my kids, two of my, my two kids at this particular stage. And this is from birth to about two. And Piaget was not real worried about the exact dates. He wasn't worried about, in fact, he thought it was funny that Americans wanted to push their kids to rush them through the stages. And he said, just stimulate them, give them normal problems in life, and they'll, they'll get through these stages just fine. Sensory motor, about birth to two, the kids' primary tasks that they're looking at is they're tasting everything, they're touching things, they're trying to explore their environment. They're looking around, they're pushing peas off their dinner, uh, played onto the floor and watching them drop. They're just exploring their environment. And they're learning what's happening between the sensations coming into them and their motor output. The first time that little kid grabs its toe and bites it and squeals and realizes, my god, I just bit myself. You know, that's sensory motor stuff. But one of the key things that happens in this stage is peekaboo. And it's a fun game. Before a certain age, it's not a very fun game. The kid just kind of looks around. But it becomes an extremely fun game between adult and child when you put, a, put something in front of you, you know, like you use this umbrella and all of a sudden you disappear, and the kid just laughs when you reappear, you disappear, and the kid just laughs when you reappear. What's going on there? Piaget says that the kid is developing what we call object permanence. That at some stage early in a child's life, the child does not understand that when mom and dad are gone, that they're really just someplace else. That it takes them a while to feel that the person is still alive. So when I go behind this umbrella, the young child, the young baby, will think I've disappeared, and then I magically reappear, and it's just hilarious. They just laugh their little tushes off. Well, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. When they develop this and several similar things of object permanence, they move to the next stage. And that, remember the word operational? This next stage is pre operational. So this kid would not understand the concept of 4 plus 7 is the same as 7 plus 4. And during this stage, the kid lives in a very egocentric world. Now what does that mean? Well, the kid sees 
everything from its perspective and cannot take the view of the other very easily at all. Uh, it lives in a magical world where dreams come in through windows or the leaves are flying down the street because the leaves want to fly down the street. Uh, and they're just so much fun. They just have such a wonderful take on the world at that particular time. Um, Pre-operational, they're working on tasks of conservation. Okay? And one of the first tasks of conservation that they develop is let's say we have a series of pennies. And we put them all in two rows like this. And you ask the child, which row has the most pennies, row one or row two, or do they have the same amount? They'll look at that and they'll go, they've got the same. Then you take row two and you spread it out. Don't add any pennies. And you ask which row, row one or row two, has the most pennies or do they have the same? And they'll look at that and they'll go, hmm, this one has the most pennies. And early children who are dealing with this issue won't even have a question in their, their voice because it doesn't seem like there's any big deal. Then you ask them to count them and they go, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. They go, God, they both have the same. They both have six pennies. That's one of the first tasks of conservation when they realize you can change how far things are apart and you haven't increased or decreased the number. Okay? Another task of conservation is the conservation of volume. Now, if you have a party with a bunch of pre-operational kids between about two and seven, and that's about the age group they fit here, two to seven typically fits, something of that nature, and you have different size lemonade glasses, and they all look different, and the kids thought some were tall and skinny and some were short and fat, you know, the kids look at it and they think that uh, one or the other had more lemonade, and you'd end up with lots of fights and squabbling over who got the most lemonade. But if you took something like this, tall and skinny, and you poured that water into a cup, and you ask the pre-operational child which had the most water or do they have the same amount of water, the pre-operational child will say one or the other, usually the tallest, right? Let's spill it here. And you'll say, why? And they say, well, because it's bigger, because it's taller, because it's up to here. In other words, they don't have the conservation of volume. This is the conservation of volume that we're talking about here, that they can see that volume can change. So the first one was conservation of number. the pennies. The second one is conservation of volume. And when they accomplish these and several other tasks like that, they then move on into the next stage. The third one would be conservation of mass. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say you've got two balls of clay and you get the kid to look at them, play with them, until the kid finally agrees that they're exactly the same amount of clay in each, and that sometimes is no small task. And then you roll one of the balls of clay right in front of their eyes in something long and skinny, like a hot dog. And you show it next to the ball of clay, and they both have the same amount. And you ask them, which has the same amount, or does one have more? They usually point to this one and say, this one has more. And you say, why? They go, well, it's much bigger. It's out to here. They're acting like, why are you asking such stupid questions, Dad? Well, when they achieve this task and they can realize that volume can, or that mass can be changed in size without change in amount, then they're moving on to the third stage. So when you ask a kid questions during the pre-operational stage, you may get discouraged with their answers, but it may not be because they're giving you trouble, but simply because they think differently. Another thing that might happen during the pre-operational stage is you come home from a long day at work, you step on a rock mistakenly that's near the driveway, and your kid goes, Wah! breaks out crying. You go, jeez, the last thing I need. I've had a hard day. What are you crying about? It's a darn rock. And the kid says, you just stepped on my pet turtle, Herman. Well, what's pet turtle, Herman? To him, that lock, rock is alive. So it's an animistic level of reasoning as well. When they accomplish these tasks, and they start becoming more adult-like, they move sometime around age seven into about age 12 into the stage of concrete operations. Concrete operations. And in concrete operations, they're more logical. They're no longer pre-operational. They understand that four plus seven is the same as seven plus four. They can do maps of their local neighborhood. 
Uh, they're understanding things on a concrete level, things they can manipulate. They've attacked, they've, uh, they've dealt with the uh, levels of conservation, they're through that task and they can do those well. But they're concrete thinkers, they're not abstract thinkers, they're not talking about abstract visions of God and how they might disagree philosophically with their parents about the meaning of the universe or life or something of that nature. And then along, and that's, that's probably about 7 to 12. Again, he says they're thinking differently than us, and if we want to understand them, then we, we deal with that. Then somewhere around age 12 to adulthood, uh, the stage of formal operations begins to appear. And this is abstract thinking. Much more abstract than they were able to do prior to this. Oftentimes start questioning Uh, ideas about God, whether God exists or if God's like uh, his parents or her parents have raised him to believe. They start getting into some conflicts with the parents because up to now these kids agreed with the parents on lots of things and got along with their beliefs and now they just spend hours sitting there daydreaming about the infinity and the universe and things that are just mind-boggling. They're really thinking at a very formal level. Uh, this is when they can start doing things like algebra a lot easier. They can do it before then. But algebra starts to become easier to teach, not easy to teach or easy to learn, but easier to teach and learn at this particular stage. Now, most of us spend most of our lives day to day in the stage of concrete operations. And, and as adults, we have these abstract ideas and we think about things on that level. But a lot of the problems we need to solve every day are concrete operational level sorts of, of, of issues. So if we look at Piaget, he says if you want to understand your kid, you have to realize that kid is thinking differently than, than you are thinking. Let's end with one practical application to teaching. If you take Piaget's ideas, his ideas about teaching are extremely different than those from operant conditioning. The operant conditioning person would break down a complex task into little bitty pieces, reward the person at each step for learning each piece, and then at the end they'd have learned the whole thing. Well, that's obviously very appropriate for some types of learning. But in terms of Piaget, he argues that you need to lead the person up to the edge, not tell them all the answers. Let them get in a series of disequilibrium disequil and being confused, and then they have to come up with an answer. They have to solve the problem. So a good teacher walks that fine balance between going so far over the kids or the people's heads that they're dealing with that uh, they lose them and confuse them totally, but they don't want to give everything. They want to solve the problem themselves, and that's when real learning takes place, according to Piaget, is by being confused and having to work out the problem. Thank you very much.